firstly, the disclaimer. Um, I've had a bit of man flu in the last couple of days, so I do apologise for uh, any sniffing, coughing or spluttering that goes on during this speech. Um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, for those who were here two years ago, they would have recalled that I didn't start out with this topic, so I'll try and tell a bit of a story as to how I got from improving efficiency of self-propelled sprayers into encouraging more women in broadacre agriculture. I can actually draw a line straight through those two things, but not many other people can. So ours is a family farming business. We're located at Yelana and Kaku on Lower Air Peninsula, which is about 650 kilometres from Adelaide. Or as I said many, many times while I was away, I'm from South Australia. No one knows where South Australia is. I'm from South Australia. It's in the middle at the bottom. The crops we grow are wheat, malt barley, feed barley, canola, and we have got a bit of a passion for pulses, so we grow uh, faba beans, lupins and lentils. The region that I'm from is totally reliant on export grain, with wheat and canola as our biggest air, uh, crops. Um, there are many people I'd like to thank, given a scholarship like this, but I'd particularly like to acknowledge uh, my partner Julie, uh, four children, Sophie, Isaiah, Chelsea and Noah, and my parents, Max and Julie, and my brother Geordie and his wife Kylie, um, and Matt, uh, more than full-time, does everything type bloke. I'd also really very much like to acknowledge the support of uh, my sponsor, the GRDC, and in particular, uh, Sharon O'Keefe, who when I came and said I was going to change my topic, she was really excited that I, a man was going to look at why aren't there more women in ag. So, why did I start? Uh, my in-laws are from Queensland, and while I was up there on a family holiday in 2013, I looked up an old uni mate of mine, because it was better than sitting around having a cup of tea with my in-laws. Um, and uh, I, this mate of mine, he's a cattle geneticist, and in 20, just 2013 was just after the ABC's Four Corners program that was shown, that, that showed uh, the terrible things that was happening to uh, the live cattle trade with, with regards to how um, cattle were being, were being killed in Indonesia. And so Greg and I had quite a uh, reasonable discussion about this and, and how urban people who didn't know anything about agriculture, they pushed a government to end the live cattle trade. And uh, we were sort of tossing around, I said, who can we blame? Do we blame the government for closing this down? Do we blame the city people for making this ruling or the ABC TV who filmed it? And came to the conclusion, Greg sort of said, well, perhaps it's actually our fault. Perhaps we in agriculture haven't done a very good job of telling our story and saying how good agriculture is. And it went on from there as, why don't we do a better job of telling how we actually are in the business, following on very much from what Sue said, that we're in the business of managing our soil and crops, our animals, sustainably for the future. So from that meeting with uh, my mate Greg, I got really quite active on social media and I post images of our grain operation and in particular the sprayer because it's a big focus of, of our business. Um, I'll try and explain why we're doing and and uh, how, how this runs and what we're doing out there, and that we're actually not in the business of using toxic chemicals to poison food because we like doing it, because it's damn expensive. And so we're always trying to explain what we do. So I played around with Instagram and Twitter and Snapchat and LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, I'm always amazed how many of my neighbours follow me and uh, only ever comment when I see them at the footy, they never comment online. And there's a, a whole lot of boys in my daughter's class at school that follow us on Instagram, which is sort of funny. Um, I'm not always ridiculously positive, sometimes this sort of thing happens and I get a lot of uh, helpful neighbourly comments on advising me how to drive better. That thing has 1.4 metres underbody clearance, so when you see it down that far, it's a, you need a big shovel. Um, I do sometimes get a bit uh, jumpy on, on social media. The comments on, on the one side is there's from Twitter, um, something I put that the market wants no grubs and lentils, but the public doesn't want any chemicals, but the public won't pay for lentils with, with holes in them from grubs eating them. So that's why we use insecticide, is because basically unless you want grub holes in your lentils, that's the way we're going to go. The other comment is uh, something I picked off Facebook and then put on Twitter. Um, it's a label of pasta you can buy in any supermarket. It's from responsibly grown Australian wheat. Our wheat doesn't have that label on it, so as is irresponsibly grown, I guess. It's just a, it's picking up again on what Sue says, that labels can tell any sort of story and, and you need to use social media to be on top of this and keep up to where, where people are. Um, one of the advantages of social media is, uh, this is actually, a, we were contacted via our Facebook page, um, this is a group of rural uh, GPs, trainee GPs, 
who contacted us and they visit us post harvest because these are people that are going to end up working in urban and rural areas. And so they came and spoke to me because a lot of these people, they're urban trained doctors. They've never actually seen the sort of injuries that farmers get. They had no concept at all of the machinery we deal with. So I parked a few bits around the yard and, and we walked around and, and walked around and we had a, quite a discussion on injuries and that happens to farmers that are a bit unique to other people and also physical and, and in particular mental health. For me, this is the reason that, that I do social media. This is a photo of, of one of our seeding tractors and they're in the middle of that image is a little tiny toy tractor. And so an urban girl I knew from a long time ago, um, she followed her page and anyway, I caught up with her and went out for dinner with her when I was in Adelaide one time and I took that little toy tractor and I gave it to her three-year-old son. Now that child, he's three, he's never seen a farm, he doesn't know anything about farming, but now he's got that toy tractor and he goes to his school and I've, I've, it came back eventually to me that he took that tractor to school. And so there's an urban kid he doesn't know anything about, but he goes to school in, in Adelaide and now he has a connection. When I post a video of that tractor working, he can see that video and he knows that that thing's growing food. This little toy tractor just made that connection. So I don't care for me how many followers I have on social media, because that one kid and then this one, that, that was just absolute gold. So this is another child that uh, got hold of, his mum sent me a photo of some wheat that he was trying to grow from chook screenings. That was terrible because this, the grain is all small. And Anyway, he was really proud that he'd grown some wheat and they sent me a photo of him growing wheat. So this year I sent him a heap of uh, the two fertilisers that we use and all the crop types we grow. And then I told him how many um, plants a hectare he needs got him, because you know, I liked educating kids, he uh, had to work out how many square metres that translated to and how many seeds, because I wasn't going to do that hard sort of stuff. And um, so he was trying to grow the same crops as me this year. Didn't rain for us and we didn't, he actually beat us on it. So <laughs> anyway, uh, this is the other one that comes up a bit on uh, the Facebook and Instagram. Um, uh, I often post photos like this um, and it's interesting when you get into social media but you can actually learn to read it and work out who's, who's liking what you post. So images like this do gain a lot of likes, hearts and comments. More women like these posts than my photos of tractors for example. But I like to put these sort of things in as they like. They're baby quails if, in case you didn't know and a lizard that I found at harvest. Um, <coughs> So, so this, it, I put them in because it shows that agriculture, even though you know, it's a great big fields of wheat and it's not particularly interesting, it is about caring for all the wildlife that inhabits on our property. So what does all this have to do with women in agriculture? At my interview, I did actually say that I was looking at efficiency of self-propelled sprayers and social media. That's what I told Nuffield. And then, and then so I, they gave me a scholarship and then I said, well, I'm not doing that anymore because I, our business expanded and our sprayer operator, you're looking at him, um, was getting fairly frustrated with just how much time he spent in that machine and so it was looking at ways to improve the efficiency and so I wanted to get more hectares covered in a given time frame because basically I don't like sitting there. And then I met uh, Nuffield scholar Dave Gooden and he builds batching trailers and he basically convinced me to buy a batching trailer so that improves the rate at which we load the sprayer which meant that we could get more done in a day. So that solved my Nuffield scholarship before I'd even done my Nuffield scholarship. So, so someone gave me a heap of money and I had to work out what to do. So because I'm clever I thought what better way to go around the world in talking to intelligent women in agriculture. What a cracking idea. So here we go. So you can, you can see how I got from self-propelled sprayers to women in ag. Anyway, um, part of it is that we men do a fairly crap job of thinking about the women in our lives. And so we grow a lot of canola, and canola, when you cut it off, you end up with stalks about this high, and, because you, and they're sort of around like a thumb-sized stalk. And when you cut them off, they're sharp. And I don't mean a little bit, like we wear jeans when we cut canola, because it scratches your legs, and it really, really hurts. Now, there's no toilets in the middle of our fields, and when I want to go, I just go. And I saw this photo and I went, yeah, because when women want to go, they sort of have to squat down. And there's a whole lot of images when you've got sharp, pointy spikes like this high and you want to go. And so that is a cracking bit of invention, not done by a man, on how to make going to the loo much easier if you're a canola farmer. So I was looking at how we in rural Australia can use social media to do a better job of communicating to urban people. And I discovered that many other scholars, including Suze, were looking at this topic and I re-evaluated that why I wanted to look at was why is there so few women in the Australian broadacre grain compared to other sectors of agriculture? 
So several conclusions led me to believe that this was a really good idea to, to encourage more women in ag. And, and primarily it's around this, and this is a sort of serious bit. In our society, women are still the major uh, purchasers of food, and it seems to me that old boring white guys that look a lot like me, we've done a pretty terrible job of convincing the public that the food we produce is safe. The anti-toxic chemical organic type movement is gaining a lot of traction, even though much of their information is based on opinion and not fact. People who purchase food, they don't trust boring old white guys like me when we say, oh, I sprayed it, it's safe, I followed the labels, trust me. So I actually think we need more women in grain because they do a better job of telling a story. And a better story will mean that people would trust farmers better. So that's part one. Part two is several years ago, after we made significant changes to our farming business, um, I was interviewed by a young female journalist for our state's agriculture newspaper. And at the close of that interview, I said, how often do you interview women, just out of curiosity? She said, never. Women aren't grain farmers. And it just really resonated with me, that comment, that, that other women don't think that women are grain farmers. And then the, the, third, the third of the reasons that why I got to this is I'm a father of two boys and two girls. And while my children are still young, People often assume that the boys will be farmers and not the girls, and I wonder why. And then finally, it's just before I left on my Nuffield scholarship, a colleague's wife gave birth to their fourth child, a little boy. Previously, they had three girls. And upon the birth of this boy, someone said, now you have someone to take over the farm. What were the other three, garden gnomes? I just find it incredulous that in 2016, women are not seen as equals in the grain sector. Because seriously, the grains business is mostly about sitting on your bum pressing buttons on an auto steer screen. It's not even hard. So now for some of the people I met on my Nuffield Scholars. So this is Cathy Brown, firstly, from the New Zealand Dairy Farmers uh, Women, Dairy Women's Network. She believes that every person needs to be assessed on their own merits. Interestingly, the New Zealand, the board of New Zealand Dairy Women's was all women, but they included a man recently because they decided they needed greater diversity. Dr. Cammy Ryan there in the middle at Monsanto, she is, was without doubt that one of the most interesting, helpful, inspiringly humorous people I ever had the pleasure of meeting. Um, she's a social scientist at Monsanto St. Louis. Um, she's a communicator in social media. Monsanto actually has a free policy on social media. Anyone who works for social media can post whatever they like about Monsanto. It's, it's a fascinating, fascinating policy. Most people still work there on the second day too. Um, but, but, Cammy said that basically, if your company doesn't like social media, then find someone who does, because it's the way that people need to communicate. And Minette Battis there, um, Robbie got me into a meeting uh, in the UK. So Minette is actually the first woman in 106 years of the United Kingdom's National Farmers Union to hold a leadership position. The first woman in 106 years. That's ridiculous. She said that women farmers appeal more to consumers because consumers are women. Minette believes agriculture has not sold its story very well and it's poor at engaging with a wider population. Uh, the woman standing next to me here is Dean Helene Dillard from the University of California. It's actually my alma mater. Um, UC Davis, uh, I went there about 20 odd years ago, which sort of gives a bit, way a bit of how old I am. 62% of women are in, uh, 62 of women enrolled across the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences now. That, that was 2017 figures. And when I was there about 20 years ago, it was about a third women, and now it's 62%. So it's come a long way. It's more than half, which is fab fantastic, really interesting, except that much of that actual increase, and I saw this, um, Sue's got me to interview uh, a couple of people in the Netherlands as well, and um, it's very common. The, the primary numbers are veterinary, really, and so when you say agriculture and environmental, uh, so in UC Davis, it's now 90, just over 90% of the, veterinary, the vets coming out of the veterinary college are, are female. So the numbers are skewed by one sector, but huge enrolment of women being tertiary educated. Uh, the middle photo is just that a Nuffield scholarship for all you, for the new people, it opens doors like that. The dep deputy minister to the premier, and you just say, you ring them up and you say, I'm a Nuffield scholar, and they say, come in. It's not quite that easy, but it's amazing where you can get to with, with, this, with this badge. It really is incredible that, at how well it's respected. Six women at the Department of Agriculture in Saskatchewan, Canada. An incredible rapid fire meeting. I thought I was meeting one of them. I sat in a table where there were six women talking to me and I just couldn't take notes for our stuff. 
Some of the reasons that they did write, that I did write down that makes it difficult to be a female entering the grains industry. There is a serious sex issue. Male farmers can't visit female farmers because the wives get jealous. Millennial girls assume that the old boys club will soon retire, but if the next generation of boys is influenced by their fathers, the old boys club does remain the same. And there are many organisations out there that are old boys clubs. Female salespeople can't ride in the combine or grain harvester with male farmers and vice versa because the partners get jealous. We're talking about riding in combines, people. Women who do succeed, particularly in male-dominated sectors, they often get knocked down by other women. Okay, more people that I met. Laura Lee, this is, she's on a dairy farmer in Illinois. This is one of the fantastic things that does happen uh, when you're on a Nuffield scholarship. So, so Laura Lee, they're milking the cow. Her mother uh, ran a program at a university that I wanted to speak to. And she said, all right, go and stay with my daughter. It's only just out of Chicago. Just hire a car and drive an hour there and stay with her. And I'll drive six hours across the country to meet with you. Okay, I said, so I rocked up and this girl was, I don't know, 28, and I said, hi, I'm Red, or your mum said I could stay here. And uh, I did, I slept in her house for two days, and, and then her mum turned up, so it was fascinating, <laughs> just how it goes. Anyway, Laura Lee to me was particularly fascinating, because, glo because at the moment, global dairy is in a fairly bad place, just due to massive oversupply. And all the men around Laura Lee's farm, they're all dairy guys, they've all increased the size of their dairy herd. Why? Because the best way to get out of um, not having any money is trade more, isn't it? You make more. So all these guys have increased the dairy numbers, they're feeding more cows, they're trying to make more milk to make money. They're all losing money. They're hemorrhaging money all over the place. Laura Lee just halved a dairy herd, shut down one of the barns, put some people off. So they're all losing money, but guess who's losing less money? It was just such a... She's female and she thought of that. And I would have been like all those guys. Let's just all work harder and not get anywhere. Anyway, uh, Desiree here um, in the Netherlands. She sold out of dairy after her father pa passed away. And she's actually diversified into pigs. And she'd modified handling because she's not a very big person. And pigs, are, pigs take some reasonable physical. And she had different techniques to move them around. Um, it was just fascinating. A very softly spoken girl. But uh, just a really interesting, fabulous meeting. Um, and Sue's there, I'll, I can talk about Sue. Sue's is one of the two fantastic people that was on my GFP. Sue's uh, has cows, pigs, fattening pigs apparently. And she runs a little bit of a show. And when you're on a GFP, you introduce yourselves and each other to hundreds of people. And Sue's kept saying cows and pigs and a little bit of a show. And I reckon we were about two months in before I finally said, so you keep saying a little bit of a show. What's a little bit of a show? Because we used to run a field day on our place and like one year 200 people came and we thought we were a big deal. So Suze runs a little bit of a show, as she said. It's 40,000 people turn up. 40,000? It's not 40,000 people in South Australia if you take Adelaide out of it. My study did actually near, no, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, Erica there, that's in uh, Canada. And so Erica is standing by that big truck that was her farm run around Ute. She manages 14,000 acres, which is about 5,600 hectares of grain production in Canada. She took that on when her father passed away, employs a staff of eight or 10 or something and runs six John Deere combines, is absolutely passionate about grain. Um, and Juka, who's a Nuffield scholar, might be known to some of you. She's the only female fruit trader in the Netherlands with her first crop of kiwi fruit. Although they'll probably rename it because they're Dutch and they're a bit clever like that. Okay, so um, some more people. These are my two girls in the top corner here. They're wearing t-shirts from the Iowa State program that Laura Lee's mum runs. Um, and it's just to encourage, get more people aware of and encourage the next generation of women into ag. It just says, farm like a girl. Uh, Liz was the other one on my GFP. She's um, another fantastic girl that was, was with us on our GFP. She's a cattle geneticist, Nuffield Scholar, and runner-up Farmer of the Year in 2011. Uh, Iris and Suze again, she just keeps peer appearing, Suze does. Um, Iris, who Suze taught me, she's actually the Dutch young farmers representative on the EU, and we had quite a long chat about um, uh, some of the sexism issues that she sees in the EU and in particular how, how people treat her as a, as a young female. So that was, so I, I did have a, quite a lot of moments of fairly heartfelt conversations. Um, and uh, this is me in Illinois with Jennifer and her father. 
And so this was, this was utterly fascinating. I, I was just going for a drive one day because I needed to be in the next town. And someone said, oh, while you're there, meet so-and-so. He said, you need to meet so-and-so. He said, come with me, we're going to go and meet Jennifer. So I got to meet Jennifer on her farm with her dad. And so while I was there, like, it was, I'm a grain farmer, okay, so I will get a little bit excited as I explain this story. So I was there with Jennifer, and firstly, the harvest is on tracks, and I'm a bit of a track person, and that was particularly exciting because it was on tracks, and then she let me drive, and it was corn, and I've never harvested corn. And so I got to harvest corn on tracks, and I was sitting with a female on her farm. It was utterly fascinating. And, and Jennifer said that she didn't want to be a role model. She just saw herself as a farmer, not a female farmer. But I took a selfie in the cabin and sent it to Julie, who showed it to my eight-year-old daughter. And the message came back really quickly, like it does with great technology, that my daughter just said, Dad, it's a girl driving a harvester. Because my eight-year-old daughter had never seen a female drive a grain harvester. And I had to be in Illinois to, to see that happen. That's just... It's just one of those utterly mind-blowing examples. And so Jennifer suddenly went, it just went across the world and back again, that my daughter had finally seen another girl drive a grain harvester because she'd never seen that. And that was the moment where I went, this, this can work. It just needs more women telling about more women can do this. There's no reason you can't. Anyway, so after I finished speaking with Jennifer, so that was her grain harvester reaping her crop on her farm, then I went and she said, oh, my husband's over there. So I went and went to his farm in his combine, reaping his corn, but he didn't let me drive. <laughs> okay, um, so as Suze and Tom, our Irish guy on our GFP, told me many, many times that the most important females in global agriculture are without doubt dairy cows, and I don't know how many dairy cows we saw, but they're a very important part females in agriculture, dairy cows are important. So some of the other things that I did see here, Irish cows, Canadian combines, American corn, the Swiss Alps where I saw cheese being, artesian cheese being made at 1700 metres above sea level over a timber fire and a woman and her husband because they can charge some exorbitant amounts of money for milk if they turn it into handmade cheese. And GM cotton growing there in the USA and for those who aren't aware, I'm from South Australia, we're the only state we can't grow GM anything so I, they put it behind a glass box so I I couldn't touch it. Um, right, so now you want some answers, don't you? Um, so there are more, some reasons why you don't see more women in ag. For, partly it's history. So I started in Ireland, and uh, if, you've, if a country like Ireland, where you've got about a thousand odd years of the farm goes to the eldest son, then it's pretty unlikely you're going to get it if you're a female. It's just an unfortunate fact of life, but history like that just takes some rule changing. Parents is a really interesting one. It came up over and over again in my topic. So many women I spoke to, they said they're not, they're not farmers because my dad said I couldn't be, I'm a girl. And if you, if you are sitting here in this room as parents and you say to your girls between now, between when they're born and when they're about 10, girls aren't farmers. By the time they're 10, it doesn't matter what you say, it's just in their mind, they cannot they cannot change that. So it's very really important if you're a parent to, to tell your girls they can be whatever boys can. You know that stuff, but you just needed me to tell you. Uh, the third one is identification, actually. Women don't identify as being a grain farmer. I observe this over and over and over and over again. Women still use terms like farmer's wife. How many men have ever said, I'm a farmer's husband? Like, it's just an irrelevant ridiculous term, farmer's wife. So women, they'll admit that they look after the family, they manage the business books, they drive the utes to move the people, they can move machinery, they pick up parts from the town, they drive the smaller, maybe the secondary tractor, but they don't identify as being a farmer. Why are you not a farmer? <sighs> well, I don't drive the cedar, I don't drive the harvester. So that's what a farmer is, people, I found it out. A farmer is someone who can drive a cedar or a harvester. Like, it, sometimes, you women, you need to identify and call yourselves what you want to be called, not ridiculous terms like farmer's wife. So part of the no women grain farmers is actually that very few, few women identify as being farmers, when really this is more about the definition of being a farmer. And finally, Marie Crawford, who was just fabulous to me, from Toowoomba, she's eldest technical services manager. She spoke at the Summer Grains Conference in 2016 and she identified from her research that the grains industry does have a higher incidence of partners doing off-farm work than any other sector of the ag economy. 
By partners, one usually assumes this means wives. And indeed, Marie stated that the survival of many family farms would be threatened if wives worked off-farm. So why does the grain business require more off-farm cash? My own speculation, backed up by national and international travel, is that the grains industry, the farm pays the accounts, while the partner actually works to soak up, to support the family. The excess cash in grain businesses generally gets soaked up in massive, rapidly depreciating assets. We call them tractors, and harvesters, and sprayers, and seeders, and, and, and. Anyway. However, it is changing. When I came home from university, I rarely saw women involved in agriculture, but now, in my part of the world, they are far more visible. And interestingly, this topic of mine is a live one, and it has a focus. Indeed, 2017 scholar Katrina Sass is currently looking at daughters in ag, a topic closely related to this, and I've had many conversations with her. Perhaps the next generation, there will be a far more even ratio. For a diversity of opinions and different perspectives on how to feed an ever-increasing global population profitably, I really hope so. And finally, thank you very much to these eight people, thoroughly good people to stay awake with for 36 hours across several time zones and around the globe. Thank you very much.